a client met his banker to discuss opening a restaurant in a busy airport. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of reaching for the sky. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 36, for broadcast on the 9th of May, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's InSight mission blasts off bound for the red planet Mars. The cosmic X-rays that may be providing new clues about the nature of dark matter. And federal funding finally approved for an Australian space agency. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's InSight mission has successfully blasted into space on the start of a 483 million kilometre, six and a half month journey to the surface of the red planet Mars. InSight will be the first mission to explore the internal structure of Mars, trying to find out what lies deep beneath the red planet's free stride surface. InSight's instruments include a seismometer, a heat flow probe, and a radio science experiment. These instruments will shed light on how warm and geologically active Mars is, studying its reflexes as it whips about in its orbit around the Sun and providing essential clues on the evolution of terrestrial worlds in our solar system. The 57-metre-tall United Launch Alliance Atlas V blasted off from Space Launch Complex 3E at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The flight was the first interplanetary mission to launch from Vandenberg. All 20 of NASA's previous Mars missions have launched from Cape Canaveral, taking advantage of Earth's rotation by launching towards the east, the planet's rotation providing a little extra momentum for the launch. Vandenberg's usually used for polar low-Earth orbit launches, or commonly used by Earth sciences and military spy satellites. However, InSight's low mass of just 694 kilograms is well within the launch capabilities of the Atlas V, even in its basic 401 configuration used for this flight, making a launch from Vandenberg economically viable. We are listening into the final minutes three. of the countdown. Go Atlas. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go InSight. We're at T minus 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 0. Of the Atlas V, launching the first interplanetary mission from the West Coast, and NASA's Insight, the first outer space robotic explorer to study the interior of Mars. RD-180 continues to look good at this point in the mission. Ejector pressures, pump speeds, expected regions, extra ratio controlling within expected parameters. The RD-180 engine providing 860,000 pounds of thrust. The cool body rates continue to look good. All booster systems look nominal at this point. Mach 1. The rocket is now traveling faster than the speed of sound. Coming up, the rocket Q. will enter max Q. This is the point where mechanical stress on the rocket reaches its peak because of the rocket's velocity and resistance created by Earth's atmosphere. Coming up on the throttle down, extra has throttled back right on schedule. Signatures look good. Pump speeds, injector pressures continue to look right within band. Body rates controlling down the middle. Current altitude is 13 miles, downrange distance 7 miles, current velocity 1,965 miles per hour. Closed loop guidance has begun. The first part of the flight was pre-programmed trajectory. Now the rocket is giving itself feedback on its flight path. And Q alpha steering has begun. Body rates look good. Pump speeds, injector pressures all within band. RCS pyro valve has been fired. System is now pressurizing flight level. Signatures look good. Current altitude is 30 miles, downrange distance 43 miles, current velocity 4,540. 
42 miles per hour. The Atlas V rocket, the RD-180 engine, continues to burn. Flight rates continue to look good. RD-180 is still performing well. Due off the steering has been completed. Booster is now one quarter of its liftoff weight. Currently flying at 4 G's acceleration. Boost phase cooldown has begun. Pogo pyro valve has been fired. Doing the throttle to 5 G's. We are three minutes, 50 seconds into flight, and we're nearing booster engine cutoff, or BECO. Back to 4.6 G's in preparation for BECO. Boost phase cooldown has completed. And we have BECO. Shutdown looks good. And the RD-180 engine on the first stage of the Atlas V has shut down. About four minutes after launch, the upper stage Centaur rocket successfully separated from the Atlas V core stage, placing InSight into a parking orbit 13 minutes and 16 seconds after launch. Stage separation. We have box and fuel pre-start. The GN2 purge firing. The RCS is underway. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. And the second stage, and stage engine, the RL-10, has ignited. And we have indication of payload fairing jettison. It's like a good step. And the payload fairing that was encapsulating the InSight spacecraft has been jettisoned. The RL-10C engine, the Centaur, continues to burn. Our GN2 purge firing is underway for thermal conditioning. And Centaur has gone to closed loop view control in a slightly fuel-rich Extra ratio correction. And a quick look at the booster stage performance shows a very nominal booster. We had an on time liftoff of the Atlas V rocket carrying NASA's InSight spacecraft, as well as two small CubeSats called Marco. This burn is scheduled for 8 minutes and 56 seconds in length. 61 minutes later, the center upper stage ignited for a second time taking InSight out of Earth orbit and onto a heading bound for the red planet Mars. InSight separated from Centaur about nine minutes later, some 93 minutes after launch, and then successfully contacted mission managers through NASA's Deep Space Communications Network. InSight project manager Tom Hoffman from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the spacecraft is in good health and on course for the planet Mars. With its successful launch, NASA's InSight team are now focusing on the six-and-a-half-month voyage. During this cruise phase of the mission, engineers will check out the spacecraft's subsystems and science instruments, making sure its solar arrays and antenna are properly oriented, tracking its trajectory, and performing maneuvers to keep it on course. InSight is slated to land on a broad plane in the Elysium Planetia region, just north of the Martian equator, on November 26. The landing site should have ample year-round sunlight, providing enough warmth and solar power to keep the mission operating for around a year and 40 days on Mars. That's around two Earth years. InSight is the rather tortured acronym for Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy and Heat Transport. Built by Lockheed Martin, the land is based around the successful design for NASA's Mars Phoenix probe, which launched back in August 2007, landing in the northern polar Martian plains in May 2008. Previous missions to Mars, including Phoenix, all investigated the surface history of the Red Planet by examining features like canyons, volcanoes, rocks and soil. But no one's attempted to investigate the planet's earliest evolution, which can only be found by looking deep below the surface. And that's where InSight comes in. It'll help unlock the mysteries of Mars in a totally new way, not by studying the surface of the red planet, but by looking deep inside to learn about the earliest building blocks of Mars. InSight's lander will probe and collect data on Mars quakes, the flow of heat from the planet's interior towards the surface, and the way in which the planet wobbles as it orbits around the Sun. Looking deep into Mars will let scientists better understand how different the Martian crust, mantle and core are from their counterparts here on Earth. Scientists hope by detecting Mars quakes and other phenomena inside the red planet, InSight can better understand how Mars formed. It carries a suite of sensitive instruments designed to gather these data. Unlike the rover missions, these instruments require a spacecraft that can sit very still on the Martian surface, carefully placing its instruments on the ground and below the surface. In some ways, InSight's a little bit like a sort of scientific time machine. It'll send back information about the earliest stages of Mars's formation four and a half billion years ago. You can't do this on Earth because our planet's been constantly evolving through erosion and evolution and vulcanization, constantly recycling its surface and mantle. So by studying Mars, scientists can learn how gas, dust and heat combine and arrange themselves into planets including the Earth, its moon, the other terrestrial worlds of the inner solar system, and even exoplanets in other solar systems. Shortly after InSight separation from the center upper stage, two briefcase-sized interplanetary CubeSats, part of JPL's Mars Cube 1 technology demonstrator mission, were also successfully deployed from the Centaur to begin their own journey to Mars. 
The twin Mars Cube 1, or Marco spacecraft as they're called, are the first CubeSats to travel in interplanetary space. The pair are on their own separate mission. Rather than collecting science, they'll follow the InSight lander on its cruise to Mars, testing out miniature spacecraft technology along the way. Both were programmed to unfold their solar panels soon after launch, followed by several opportunities to radio back their health. The computers inside each Marco CubeSat haven't been turned on since they were tested back in mid-March, when they were being prepared for launch. Each CubeSat has to do a lot of things right by itself in order for the team back on Earth to get their signals. Batteries have to retain enough charge for the spacecraft to deploy their solar arrays, stabilise their attitude, turn towards the sun and then turn on their radios. A couple of weeks will be spent just assessing how the Marco CubeSats are performing. If they survive the radiation of space and function as planned, they'll fly over the red planet during InSight's EDL or entry, descent and landing phase. Each of the CubeSats will use a special antenna to relay InSight's vital signs during the infamous seven minutes of terror, that crucial phase during entry, descent and landing, which has already claimed the vast majority of probes sent to land on the red planet's surface. NASA is taking the opportunity to test several experimental systems with Marco. Their radios, high-gain antennas, attitude control and propulsion systems are all included to prove new technologies in space. Marco project manager Joel Krajewski from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says he's nervous but excited about the mission. A lot of work's gone into designing and testing these components so that they'd survive the trip to Mars and relay data during InSight's landing. But the broader goal is to learn more about how to adapt cube space technologies for future deep space missions. When InSight arrives on Mars in November, it won't rely on Marco for sending data back to Earth. That job will go to NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, as well as several Earth-based astronomy telescopes. But the Marco mission could help prove the potential of CubeSats as a kind of bring-your-own-black box for future NASA missions. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Physicists studying unusual cosmic X-ray radiation emissions say it could be a sign that dark matter is composed of sterile neutrinos. The findings reported in the journal Physical Review Letters could help solve the dark matter mystery that's been plaguing science for almost a century. Scientists know dark matter exists because they can see its gravitational interaction with normal matter. They know it makes up about 80% of all the matter in the universe four times as much as the normal matter which makes up the stars, planets, moons, buildings and people. But scientists have no idea what dark matter actually is. And let's face it, without an understanding of dark matter, science's very understanding of the universe and the physics which underpins it is highly lacking. The most favoured candidates for dark matter are weakly interactive massive particles, or WIMPs, and supersymmetrical particles like the neutralino. Although the search for sussy, as supersymmetry sometimes called, has proven to be a rather fruitless affair so far. Still, physicists at facilities like the Large Hadron Collider in CERN and the Grand Sasser Laboratory in Italy are still searching for these particles, but are yet to produce any solid supporting evidence. Today's two most promising dark matter candidates are the hypothetical axion, which we spoke about last week, and the equally hypothetical sterile or right-handed neutrino. Now, as we also mentioned last week, if axions do exist, not only could they explain dark matter, but they could also help solve the strong charge parity problem in quantum chromodynamics, helping to explain matter and antimatter. However, the detection back in 2014 of unexplained spectral signatures in cosmic X-ray emissions have sent some researchers onto a very different path. The emissions were detected at energies of 3.5 kilo electron volts coming from distant galaxies and galaxy clusters. Some scientists have hypothesized that dark matter particles might decay during collisions, emitting X-ray radiation in the process. And that's caused other researchers to speculate that dark matter particles might end up being very different from what was previously assumed. One of the new study's authors, Professor Joachim Kopp from Mainz University, has proposed a new scenario in which two dark matter particles collide, resulting in their mutual annihilation. It's analogous to what happens when matter and antimatter meet. They annihilate, emitting gamma-ray radiation. Kopp says it's long been assumed that it would not be possible to observe such annihilations of dark matter if dark matter were made out of particles that light. 
So instead, Cop and colleagues developed a new model for dark matter, one which they say fits together nicely when compared with experimental data from other models. Their new model suggests that dark matter particles would be the long hypothesized Fermi on a mass particle called the sterile neutrino, which would have a tiny mass of only a few kilo electron volts. The existence of sterile or right-handed neutrinos is theoretically well-motivated, as all the other known fermion subatomic particles, including both quarks and leptons, have been observed with both left- and right-handed chirality, that is, the ability to be distinguishable from its mirror image. If they exist, sterile neutrinos could explain the changes seen in neutrino masses as they transform between tau, muon and electron neutrino flavours. As for the likely mass of the sterile neutrino, well, right now it's speculated to be pretty well anywhere between 10 to the 15 giga electron volts down to less than 1 electron volt. Although such a lightweight dark matter particle is considered somewhat problematic because it would make it very difficult to explain how galaxies could be formed. Cop says his team's new model deals with these concerns and provides an elegant way out. You see, their model suggests that dark matter annihilation is actually a two-step process in which an intermediate state is first formed and then later disintegrates into the observed X-ray photons. Cobb says the calculations show that the resulting X-ray signature does correlate closely with the 2014 spectral X-ray observations. He says at the same time the new model itself is so general that it offers an interesting starting point for the search for dark matter, even if it turns out that the spectral line observed in 2014 has a different origin. Physicists are now working on the proposed European Space Agency E-Astrogram mission, which aims to analyse astrophysical X-ray radiation with previously unachieved accuracy. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Now, don't take this personally... But Uranus smells like rotten eggs. At least it does according to scientists who say hydrogen sulfide gas permeates the planet's swirling upper atmospheric cloud tops. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, solves one of Uranus's longest outstanding mysteries. Even after decades of observations and a visit by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft, Uranus has managed to keep secret details of the composition of its clouds. Astronomers have long debated the composition of Uranus's clouds and whether hydrogen sulfide or ammonia dominated the cloud deck, but they lacked definitive evidence either way. They finally cracked the secret following sensitive new spectroscopic observations of the ice giant's cloud tops using the 8-metre Gemini North Telescope on Hawaii's Mauna Kea. The Gemini data, obtained with a near-infrared integral field spectrometer, sampled reflected sunlight from a region immediately above the main visible cloud layer in Uranus's atmosphere. The study's lead author, Patrick Irwin, from the University of Oxford, says he knew the spectroscopic absorption lines, where the gas absorbs some of the infrared light from reflected sunlight, would be especially weak and challenging to detect, but decided to attempt the observation anyway. The spectral signatures Irwin discovered were so faint they were barely visible. But visible they were. The detection of hydrogen sulfide high in Uranus's cloud deck, and presumably that of its sister ice giant, Neptune as well, contrasts sharply with the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn, where no hydrogen sulfide was detected above the clouds. In fact, the bulk of Jupiter and Saturn's upper clouds are composed of ammonia ice. These differences in atmospheric composition between the gas and ice giants sheds light on questions about the planet's formation and history. The differences between the cloud decks on the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn and the ice giants Uranus and Neptune were likely imprinted way back during the birth of these worlds. During the solar system's formative years, the balance between nitrogen and sulfur, and hence ammonia and Uranus's newly detected hydrogen sulfide, was determined by the temperature and location of the planet's formation. Another factor in the early formation of Uranus is the strong evidence that our solar system's giant planets likely migrated considerably from where they were initially formed. We know Jupiter and Saturn probably migrated closer towards the Sun before migrating outwards again. And that planetary migration affected the evolution of both Uranus and Neptune. In fact, many astronomers believe there may well have been three ice giants rather than the two we just see today. And during the gas giant's outward planetary migration process, the ice giants jostled for position. Uranus and Neptune swapped positions, and a third planet, if it existed, may have possibly been either knocked way out of the solar system or is hiding out somewhere beyond the Kuiper Belt. 
possibly the missing Planet X. What all this means is that confirming Uranus's composition is invaluable in understanding the planet's birthplace, its evolution, and refining models of planetary migrations. When a cloud deck forms by condensation, it locks away the cloud-forming gas in a deep internal reservoir, hidden away deep beneath the levels that are usually seen with telescopes. Only a tiny amount remains above the clouds as a saturated vapour. And this is why it's so challenging to capture the signatures of ammonia and hydrogen sulphide above the cloud decks of Uranus. Irwin says if an unfortunate human were to ever descend through Uranus's clouds, they'd be met with some very unpleasant conditions, and the foul stench of rotten eggs wouldn't be the worst of it. He says that suffocation and exposure to the minus 200 degrees Celsius temperatures, together with an atmosphere made up mostly of hydrogen, helium and methane, would all take its toll long before the smell. The new findings indicate that although the atmosphere might be unpleasant for humans, this far-flung world is fertile ground for probing the early history of our solar system, and perhaps understanding physical conditions on other large icy worlds orbiting stars far beyond our sun. And even more importantly, you now understand why I've always pronounced the planet's name as Uranus. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The Australian government has allocated an initial $50 million in seed funding for the establishment of the nation's first space agency. Space sciences experts have generally welcomed the initial input, as the new fledgling organisation determines its makeup and future role. Initial proposals are calling for the new space agency to simply be a one-stop front desk to guide clients to individual Australian aerospace industries and research facilities already undertaking the development and manufacture of spacecraft, their subsystems, scientific packages and propulsion systems. The new agency may also act to coordinate existing research projects. Former CSIRO head Dr Megan Clark, who undertook the federal government's review of the space sector, will head the new agency in its first year. Although it's taken a long time for Australian politicians to comprehend the need for a dedicated space agency, things weren't always so backwards. During the 1950s, 60s and even into the early 70s, Australia was one of the world's leading space-faring nations, becoming only the fourth country in the world to launch a satellite which it had built from its own soil. During its heyday, the Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia was the third busiest launch facility on the planet, with only the Soviet Union's Baikonur Cosmodrome and America's Cape Canaveral flying more rockets. The first space rockets were launched from Woomera in 1957, same year Sputnik was launched, with the site quickly developing into a major rocket and missile test and launch facility. These included the British Black Knight, Black Arrow and Blue Streak rockets, as well as the European Europa 1, which included the Blue Streak as its core stage, and the American Redstone rocket. Australia's first domestically built satellite, ReSat, was launched into orbit from Woomera in 1967. Sadly, the last orbital launch was the British Prospero X3 Space Sciences satellite, aboard a Black Arrow rocket in 1971. However, those solid days of Australia's space industry weren't to last. The rot set in when the Menzies Coalition government decided there was no future in space, allowing the -the state-of-the-art launch complexes dotted around Woomera and the adjacent Lake Hart facility to be sold for scrap metal. For the record, the global space industry has grown by about 10% each year since the 1990s. It's now worth more than $420 billion, with $9 billion annually now being spent just on space launches. And that figure alone is expected to reach $27 billion by 2025. And according to Bank of America Merrill Lynch, the space industry will be worth well over $3.5 trillion within three decades. And that lack of political vision was further perpetuated by the Whitlam Labor government, which rejected an offer for Australia to become part of the European Space Agency when they moved their European Launcher Development Organisation Eldar launch pads from Woomera to Karoo in French Guiana. This lack of vision by Australian politicians on both sides of the aisle has left a long legacy for their children and grandchildren to pay for. Unlike school kids in spacefaring nations, Australian school kids don't get to talk to astronauts on the space station or routinely send school science experiments up to space. 
Well, Australia has one of the world's highest standards of living, with average house sizes being even bigger than in the United States, the world's fourth highest life expectancy behind only Japan, Switzerland and Singapore, and the world's 12th or 13th largest economy, depending on which list you look at. Australia currently holds a minuscule 0.8% of the global space market. Mind you, over the past few decades, there have been several, though unsuccessful, attempts to re-establish a space launch facility in Australia. There was the Spacelift Australia Kisler Aerospace Plan to launch reusable rockets from Woomera. Then the Asia-Pacific Space Centre Consortium was established to use the Australian territory of Christmas Island as an equatorial launch site for Russian Soyuz rockets. However, Moscow eventually moved the project to the existing European launch site at Kourou. And then there was the famed Cape York Spaceport idea, the dream of consortium headed by Hawker de Havilland, British Aerospace and the CSIRO, to develop a commercial spaceport near the tip of Cape York, close to the equator, to initially launch Russian Zenit 3 rockets, eventually develop and build their own. It would have meant thousands of jobs and millions of dollars to the economy, but the land's traditional owners weren't happy and the project was eventually shelved. Another Queensland site, this one further south of Gladstone, was also suggested, but again, nothing ever eventuated. And that's really been the sad story of Australia's space endeavours. A lack of vision by Australian politicians can only see as far as the next election. And it has been a unique problem to this country. New Zealand established a space agency long ago, and they're now launching their locally developed electron rockets on commercial flights every few weeks. The establishment of an Australian space agency may finally put Australia back in the race. Professor Matthew Collis from the Australian National University says it's a positive first step. Well, we're delighted that Australia is going to join most countries in the world in having a space agency, and this injection of funds is a good start for it. It's $50 million over four years is what we're hearing, and that's a good way to start the space agency. But eventually, of course, it will need to be uh, even more money if we're going to have a, a space agency that can really make a difference both to building a space industry within Australia and then supporting the uses that that space industry can have for government, for industry, and of course, for scientific research as well. When we look at the uh, US space agency, NASA, and also the European space agency, what we're seeing is a fairly good balance between developing spacecraft and space missions and actually doing science in space. How do you see that happening in this country? So those, of course, are are very big countries in the case of the US or groups of countries in the case of Europe. At this stage, we're looking more like something like the UK Space Agency, which is a coordinating body, which is able to um, make things happen, which can get industry started and can build up uh, more effort in the space sector. But eventually, yes, it would be great to have a a space agency which can actually invest in actual missions and do things, not probably on our own, but perhaps jointly with NASA or the European Space Agency or the Japanese Space Agency, for example. That's Professor Matthew Collis from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. And a new report by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have shown a significant increase in the estimated percentage of children with autism spectrum disorder in the United States. The report found that 1 in 59 children have autism, up an average of 15% from just two years ago. That puts the U.S. national rate of autism at 1.7% of the childhood population. Researchers analysed data collected from the health and special education records of 325,483 children who were 8 years of age in 2014. They found autism rates ranged from a low of 13.1 per 1,000 children in Arkansas up to a high of 29.3 per 1,000 kids in New Jersey. Autism is four times more common among boys than girls. Researchers can't explain why autism rates have been increasing across the United States, although better diagnosis and reporting methods could play a role. Factors associated with a higher risk of autism include advanced parental age. Children of parents over 30 have a higher risk, which increases with parental age. Maternal illness during pregnancy also plays a part, as do genetic mutations, birth before 37 weeks gestation, and multiple births. Surgeons in the United States have successfully performed the world's first total penis and scrotum transplant. 
The reconstructive surgery team at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine performed the operation on a returned serviceman injured by a blast from an improvised explosive device, or IED, in Afghanistan. Surgeons hope the transplant will restore near normal urinary and sexual functions. A team of nine plastic surgeons and two urological surgeons were involved in the 14-hour operation, which transplanted the entire penis, scrotum, without testicles, and partial abdominal wall. While it's possible to reconstruct genitalia using tissues from other parts of the body, a prosthesis implant would have been necessary to achieve erection, and that would have increased the rates of infection. Additionally, due to other injuries, servicemen often don't have enough viable tissue from other parts of their bodies to work with. The surgery involved transplanting skin, muscles, tendons, nerves, bone and blood vessels. Very little is known about the movement patterns and mating preferences of large marine animals, many of which move across entire oceans and across a variety of habitats during their lifetime. Now marine biologists from Adelaide's Flinders University have discovered that turtles, found across vast ocean regions over several thousand kilometres, show movement and mating preferences influenced by just small differences in current circulation of just a few hundred kilometres. The findings are reported in the journal Proceedings B. A new study has confirmed that at least 10 Australian birds and 7 mammal species are likely to become extinct over the next 20 years if people are allowed to continue with current land management practices. The study by the Federal Government's National Environmental Science Program has identified the top 20 Australian mammals and birds at greatest risk of extinction within the next 20 years if there's no increase in management effort or effectiveness. The devastating findings are reported in the journal Pacific Conservation Biology. More than 400 cyber attacks by Russia have been reported against Australian businesses according to a new study. The report by the Australian Cyber Security Centre follows research presented to a meeting of Australian, British and American security agencies which found Russian state-sponsored hackers using compromised routers to conduct spoofing man-in-the-middle attacks to support espionage, extract intellectual property, maintain persistent access to victims' networks and potentially lay a foundation for future offensive operations. Meanwhile, the United States has now barred American government agencies from using Chinese telecommunications technology from Huawei and ZTE because of the security dangers they're set to pose to American telecommunications networks. The decision follows growing American concerns over state-sponsored cyber attacks emanating from China. The U.S. has also banned American companies from selling technology and software to ZTE. That move came after ZTE was caught selling technology to Iran, long considered a major sponsor of Islamic terrorism, including the Lebanese Hezbollah, the Palestinian Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorist organizations, and the Syrian Ba'athist Party dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad. Iranian government-supported hackers were also found to be responsible for cyber attacks against oil and gas companies in the Persian Gulf. Closer to home, and the scandal-ridden Commonwealth Bank, already embroiled in a multitude of allegations in the Banking Royal Commission, has now been forced to admit that it's lost the confidential personal data records of almost 20 million banking customers. Worse still, the Commonwealth Bank didn't bother telling those customers affected by the massive data security breach. The bank's been forced to admit that two old technology magnetic tapes containing information used to print account statements, including customer names, addresses, account numbers and transaction details from 2000 through to 2016, were not properly disposed of and no one at the Commonwealth Bank knows what happened to them. The missing data problem is just one of many emanating from the bank in recent years. These include revelations that cyber criminals have been using the Commonwealth Bank to launder huge sums of money with the bank failing to hand over reports of 53,306 possible dodgy transactions to the Austrac watchdog. However, despite the growing tensions about cybersecurity both at home and overseas, the largest state government in Australia, that of New South Wales, isn't supporting stronger federal reporting recommendations. With the details, Alex saharov Roy from IT Wire. I think it's maniacally stupid. I mean, what is the New South Wales government trying to hide by saying that, oh, no, we, you know, we don't want to subject ourselves to this mandatory data breach reporting requirements? The reason why they brought it in, because of all the incredible hack attacks we saw overseas against Sony, against a whole range of companies. And, you know, in Australia, we know it must be happening, but there's no mandatory reporting. And so it's all sort of swept under the carpet. But even the mandatory reporting requirements are a bit of a joke. You need to be a company that has over $3 million in turnover, or if you've sort of determined that uh, you can, you know, 
heal or seal the breach without anyone's data being affected that oh you know you don't necessarily have to report it this sounds to me like a really sort of weak it's a clayton's sort of reporting scheme what's the motivation for the reporting how does it advantage somebody by having such a breach reported to the federal police well because it, it allows consumers uh, and or other businesses whose information has been the subject of a breach thanks to a hack attack to actually know that the data the password, the username, the credit card details, whatever it might Your be. Your entire that identity. Is, yeah, has is now been has been stolen and it's being sold on dark web websites for a few dollars or a few cents or whatever it is a pop. Now, if, if you don't know that there's somebody breaking into your house, you know, you're not going to necessarily put in more security. Of course, this all follows on from what's just happened in the United States with a number of credit rating firms that have had major security breaches that have affected something like 200 million people. It's incredible. I mean, look, let's not even forget Facebook, which you know has 2 billion users, which we're pretty much now sure, more or less, that all that information has been stolen by all manner of different organizations doing various quizzes. And some of these quizzes, I mean, it's separate to the um, Equifax thing you, you were mentioning. But some of these quizzes ask you, oh, what was your first job? Oh, what, you know, what was your, what was your favorite uh, car? I mean, the answers that these questions are eliciting are usually the same sort of answers that you give for security, to, for, security for yeah. your bank, for your iCloud, for this, for that. And so this, all these databases, whether they're being culled from Facebook, whether being culled from credit rate reporting agencies or from Sony or from any number of companies, it's truly scary and, you know, it's terrifying stuff. And that report by Alex Sahar of Reut from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 